everyone. Welcome to the Fall 2021 Student Outcomes Committee Showcase. We are so excited to have you here joining us to discuss student-centered assessment practices. The Student Outcomes Committee, also known as SOC, supports college assessment practices for student learning. What this means is that we strive to enhance positive academic experiences for all learners by inspiring faculty inquiry that will transform teaching and learning. In today's world, especially, teaching and learning needs are ever-changing, and assessment helps us to understand those changing needs and become stronger practitioners. We are so excited to have such an expansive audience here today to share in our discussion. This is our second in a series of workshops intended to share scholarly assessment, gain valuable feedback, and share resources that will enhance our assessment practices. Today's event will provide you with both a practical and a theoretical approach to student-centered assessment. This is a discussion though, and not just a presentation. So at the end of each short presentation, we will ask you to provide feedback by answering questions, asking questions, sharing resources, and or offering suggestions that will positively enhance our assessment work. It is with pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sarah Sanders. After over 15 years as an adjunct faculty, Sarah took an OIO position in the Life Science Department in 2018. In 2019, she was hired as residential faculty. She teaches an introductory anatomy and physiology course, as well as two upper division AP courses. During her time as an OIO, she joined the SOP committee and has been a member for three years. Over the last couple of years, she has really enjoyed learning about assessment and incorporating these practices into her class. Although Sarah would call herself a novice, I don't agree with that, but she said that she has really enjoyed her time with SOC and appreciates the knowledge and experience that she's gained through participating in both the committee and attending workshops and conferences on assessment. It is my pleasure to hand it over to Sarah. Um, thank you, Lane, for the introduction. Um, my talk today is going to be just one example of how you can use Canvas to make improvements to your courses. Before um, joining SOC, I didn't even know what assessment was. I literally thought it was, you know, all about exams. And as Lane mentioned, you know, I had been teaching for 15 years as an adjunct prior to getting hired as a residential faculty. And those 15 years were fairly unguided. I can actually almost say completely <laughs> unguided. I taught nights and weekends, so I had zero interaction with other faculty, um, was never on a committee, was never told about any of this stuff. So I jumped at the opportunity to join a committee when I did get the OIO position, and I just happened to stumble upon SOC. Um, it was literally just one of those that it worked with my schedule, and I was just, I wanted to join something. And I'm so happy that I did because it has been a really worthwhile um, process for me. And it, it has been a process. I literally do feel like I'm still a novice. Just the other day, Lane and Kimberly, who is our assessment director, we were meeting and, and it's like I'm still uh, confused about some of the terminology. So I requested to go after um, Tawn today because she's definitely not a novice. But I hope that my talk today will inspire you that it's just, it's something that we can all do. It's stuff that we're probably already doing. So I hope that it'll just inspire you because we're probably already doing it. So why assessment? Assessment helps us as faculty know that our students are learning what we want them to learn. We all go to really great lengths to prepare our courses and hopefully at the end of a semester, we go back and we make improvements. But the question is, are we making those improvements because of just hunches like, oh, I want to change this slide or I want to add this assignment just because, or are we making those changes based on actual data? And, and that's where I've learned where assessment comes in. And assessment, as I've learned, is, is just, it's a continuous and cyclical process that we should be doing as faculty because that's what our job is. We are here to improve teaching and learning, but we can't make those improvements unless we have data that says, okay, this is what I did and did this help my students or not? 
So in fall of 2019, I met with, I actually just attended a workshop in the CTL on Campolytics, which I highly encourage you to all do if, uh, if and when it's offered. But anyways, Megan Garvey was holding this session. And at the time, again, I'm still kind of new to SOC and trying to get a grasp of the four C's and they just kind of weren't working for me. And I didn't understand how to incorporate them into my class. Megan presented kind of a little idea that we then met later about that developed one of my assessment plans. And really that was to link my questions from my exams, because again, I teach anatomy and physiology, very content driven. Um, and it's important for me to know, are my students learning what I want them to learn? So we linked my exam questions to a course competency. My competencies mostly are a body system. So I can, again, look at them by, by topic within my course. So then after exams, I can export my data. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like. I add it to a spreadsheet. Now that I can actually analyze that data and look for trends. I'm now in my third semester of doing this. So I've actually have data to be looking at. So this is what the process of setting this up looks like. Again, Megan helped me to do this. These are my course competencies. We have 11 body systems, so most of these are, you know, one of the body systems plus a few little extras. So each of those was linked as an outcome in the course. And all of my exam questions, I have all of my exam questions in a question bank within Canvas that I use to build my exams. And those questions are specifically linked to those outcomes. So if there are questions that have to do with the skeletal system, they are linked to my course outcome that has to do with the skeletal system. So all the questions on all of my exams are linked to one particular outcome. Within a unit exam, there's about six of those outcomes that are looked at usually per exam. This is what the data looks like once students have taken an exam. So this would be kind of at end of semester, although I could do it after each exam. This is all individual data. So the, if it's green, that's great. That means that they answered not just one question about that topic. It would probably be seven to 10 questions on that topic. And this, these numbers would basically be an average of that topic. So again, if it was skeletal system, they may have answered seven to 10 questions on the skeletal system. And this is their competency in that area. So we get individual data. Plus, I get a class average. I have three separate sections. I have about 125 students total. So I gather a lot of data every semester. So at the end of the semester, I can look at this data and I compile them by section. I can ask myself, you know, did I, well, did I make a change and did it help? Or does a change need to be made? Okay, so these again I, are just the values from one particular class. And now I have data again, I'm in my third semester. These are all of my course outcomes. Again, they're just competencies. And I have, these are my average for all of my students, not just one particular section. That would be a whole other area that I could look at. So what I wanted to do just going from fall, which was my first semester to spring, I wanted to focus on my first exam, which is course outcome one through five. That would be my, my first exam. So I, I looked at these values and I, first of all, I went back and I looked at all of my exam questions for that particular exam. I added in extra clarification on homeostasis and we, I added an activity for that. And I also added an activity for skin. Those are like my two lowest ones for that unit. So I just happened to choose those. But I did address all questions for that particular exam. And this is just something that you don't need to be a statistician to look at. I'm literally just looking at trends. So I want to see are things going up or are they going down? Are they staying the same? You know, I'm just looking at this information right now. I'll do more with it hopefully later. But looking at that, I did see an improvement in homeostasis that then did follow. I, I have at least the first exam for this semester as well as skin and for some reason those two particularly they were exactly the same from spring to fall so i can say okay those changes that i made 
they, it looks like it did have a positive impact. It wasn't just a fluke because then those increases carried on to even then the next semester. And then I added in, like, they had to create a video on muscle contraction. They had to create a Quizlet on bone terminology. You know, I did those things and I, I can see those numbers. So this is just literally one way that you can use Canvas to assess student learning. Canvalytics, again, is a great workshop if you're able to attend that. Um, there's lots of great information that you can gain, especially now that we're all online. I'm assuming all of you have your assessments online now as well. You can just click one little button. It just says after exam, you can click on the quiz statistics and it will tell you how many students missed question 13 or, you know, you can look at lots of information using Canvas. So again, for me, I was just kind of struggling with the whole 4C thing. I was, wasn't really sure how to incorporate it. And this system made sense to me. So it, it's really important to find out something that works for you, for your course, that's going to help you to make those informed improvements. So what we want to know. Uh, is what you guys do. What do you do to assess student learning? And then a second question, just based on what I presented and like, just look, hearing about that process, which hopefully you found simple. What would you do with that data? How would you analyze it? Um, what things would you look at? So those are kind of things that we would like to open up for discussion. This is Kimberly Folk from Vet Tech. Um, I can certainly see utilizing something like this in our courses to help make sure that the didactic part of our skills that our students have to master to be able to graduate and meet accreditation standards to be able to document that they are truly doing that. So I, I like I like this a lot. I'll be talking with Megan um, about uh, how to get our our live online courses at least set up that way. So thank you for presenting. Hi, Sarah, this is Madeline. Um, I think you're doing an incredible job. Thank you so much for sharing this. I teach math, so quantitatively, I love this stuff, right? But the one thing that I, I think that's important also is that we follow up this quantitative data with qualitative data. Because what averages and what uh, you know statistics tell us don't always really say what the students are truly learning and how they really feel about didactics as Kimberly was saying. So perhaps maybe, you know, at some point when you feel really, you know, familiar with qualitative methods that you might want to try that with your students, like interview a few of them. You, of course, you'll have to probably go through IRB for that if you're going to use the information beyond just you know for instruction you'll have to ask irb for that but anyway the, i just think that this is fabulous what you're doing i have a quick question do you know if this works for pooled quizzes or quizzes with pooled answers and or algorithmic questions i know the quiz analytics don't work very well when you use this but maybe the outcomes would be better I would definitely talk to the CTL about that. I'm, I mean, Megan helped me to set that up, but I would think that pooled data, I mean, mine is basically considered pooled data because I'm, I'm pooling multiple questions from, you know, different topics. I would think that pooled data would be fine for it. You just have to link it to one specific thing. Is there anyone who wants to share what you do to assess student learning? What are some of the things that that you might be doing? Since we've gone online, I've gone from giving three major tests to giving, I guess, 13 quizzes. And I really think that helps students because it lowers the stakes for each of the assessments. And with all of our students who have test anxiety problems, it, it really helps a lot. I mean, there is a difference between a quiz and a test, but not that much of a difference, really. So, and I make them space it out so that when they are introduced to a topic and then three weeks later, they're quizzed on it, so. And there really truly is, for some reason, there's a, something different about calling something a quiz versus an exam. Just psychologically, it makes a difference to students. 
I know in communication, we use a lot of rubrics, of course, because we're assessing on a level of performance. We're assessing speeches, group projects, and things of that nature. And so to really make sure we take the level from subjectivity to objectivity, those rubrics become essential in communication. So I know that we've even spent time in department meetings, for example, examining our rubrics together to see what kinds of things we can make sure we have similarity of assessment on. For example, assessing someone's delivery in a speech, you have to have a clarity in your rubric of what does that eye contact look like? What does that yeah. movement look like? What is the vo vocal qualities that we're looking for? And what kind of scale would represent that? So I know the rubrics in Canvas, um, uh, t most of our instructors use that. So while quizzes are a, a part of our analysis, I would say rubrics for that performance space is what we do in the area of communication more to assess student learning. So I use also quizzes. I tend to be one that does a lot of formative assessment as well as, you know, the traditional testing at the end. But what I also do is, and I've been doing for, gosh, I, I don't know, since Canvas, we've used Canvas and I realized this, is I do have the discussions, which gives me the qualitative data that I'm looking for. And um, I also use rubrics on everything that I do. So another thing that I do, Canvas doesn't really help with this, is that, for example, they have team meetings and they, they make videos of their team meetings. So again, that gives me, you know, now that we can actually see transcripts of that, and that's now that's why I do it really, I can also get that qualitative data that from that. But then their their videos also, I have a um, rubric that that grades that. So again, you know, ho hooray for Aaron for bringing up the rubric and how it makes it go from something very subjective to, or can be subjective to um, something that that's objectively done didactically, so. I have made my use to have incorporated videos. So I can, instead of just, you know, the exam, you know, they do, they have to make a video explaining the steps of muscle contraction. They have to draw the heart and then create a video explaining the flow of blood through the heart. I do have them make a lot of videos because I, I want to encourage them to draw and to talk. Um, those are two other things that, that are really important um, in my class for anatomy and physiology. I definitely don't use a rubric, um, which I, that'll be my next area, is development of rubrics to make sure that it's not subjective. You know, I think our students in STEM, especially when we ask them to do something like this, this quasi non-traditional, they kind of freak out on us. So I'm they really do, especially in my class, because they get nervous about pronunciation. And I just hopefully I just create a, a space that, you know, nobody gets made fun of that, you know, that I make it clear that it, it is difficult to pronounce a lot of the words. Um, so just even getting them over that hurdle of just saying the words, it just it helps them to understand the concept on a different level when you have to say it out loud. They probably create uh, at least seven different videos uh, in, in the class now. There are several things that people shared in the chat. Steve talked about using in Spanish courses, aligning each of the assessments with the course objectives, which are aligned with the district course competencies and moving more to project based base approaches um, using rubrics. I don't really have any elaboration on that, but uh, um, it's just effective. It's also, we haven't done this yet, but I can see and just getting some ideas from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Great job um, is. Uh, Looking across courses, not just within the course, but across the courses that we teach and looking at how students are performing across courses. And then you can look at modality, look at all sorts of things in terms of uh, assessing their learning and, and how well we're doing it to what we're doing to help students learn. So that's, uh, that's something we need to start doing too as well. So anyway, that's thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I love the idea of the project based learning. I think that gets to a little bit of what Madeline was talking about with the. The more um, qualitative data and and looking at student learning from that perspective. So, and then Kimberly talked uh, about vet tech at how they use rubrics, hands on skills assessment, one on one with instructor, which I think is fantastic. And then Christy, you talked a little bit about open ended questions and evaluation sheet, um, exporting it into a Excel spreadsheet 
a spreadsheet. Do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, just so you know, questions about what, what did you find the most useful for going forward in your, your college career in terms of relationships and, and all the dynamics that are involved with that. And then on uh, group teamwork, whether it's here, like this type, which is what we're doing a lot of, and what makes it better and but a lot of open ended to the writing and I, I to be honest, I'm never really sure what to do with it. If I've got, you know, 10 years of it, it it's just exported to me <laughs> and I adjust and and I know now with the Z degree, we're not supposed to touch them too much because it's kind of a, a template, but we use it for our own personal to be able to to do a little bit of tweaking, but everything, everything that's recorded that the students have put that effort into and put it online, I wouldn't do anything in a course without a rubric. I just, I think, I don't think it's fair at this point. I just don't. I think that you need to see very clearly posture, projection, even gestures, and that means standing up silly things. You gotta stand, I don't care if we're looking up your nose, at least you're standing, turn the fan off above you, get all the distractions out and try to recreate a essence of a classroom presentation, a collegiate pre presentation that you can. And um, I, I just, this semester I, I got one upside down and you're like, no, I'm not doing this business to watch you redo it. And you get all kinds of things and they're trying, but um, we get there, we get there and in the end, I, they don't just put the link in the discussion board, they have to embed it you have to do that. So it's like, go get the code when share in YouTube, go up in the bar, go to the cloud, hit embed, submit. And we have these nice professional presentations that hopefully when they go to another class, even if they're not talking, they know how to get from YouTube to embed it and it'll look nice and professional in their post. So that's their takeaway from taking a comm class. So you should look like you've taken a comm class compared to the other students who have not. So, you know, that's my two cents. Well, and I think that that illustrates just the ever changing needs that, that we are experiencing right now, right? With the, we have had to adapt and adjust and figure it out as we're, as we're going along. And I think that, you know, again, illustrates the importance of assessment and how we can use assessment in our practice to figure out what these needs are and uh, really respond to them effectively. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your work with us. I think that your example that you just shared is such a simple yet so effective way to engage in uh, student continuous or in continuous improvement that is going to help our students uh, learn better and uh, be better. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us and generate some ideas and, and lead a discussion that gives us all a little bit more, more ideas to think about how, how we can do this as well. So thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Hypley. And Dr. Hypley has been in the education department and education faculty member with Mesa Community College since 2001. Before that, she taught high school English uh, in both Northern California and Arizona for 10 years. She is a huge advocate for student-centered learning, and she has an avid interest in developing knowledge and skills for her students to lead self-fulfilling lives. Her earliest involvement with SOC in its current iteration was in 2014 and 2015, and she says that she finds the scoring guides um, of the four C's to be an incredible opportunity to create authentic and meaningful learning experiences that guide student learning, as well as an opportunity to continually refine her instruction to meet program needs. So I'm very excited to hand it over to Dr. Hypley for another perspective on how we can approach uh, assessment from a student-centered perspective. So hopefully something will be valuable. This idea of teaching, but did they learn it? How, how do we know what's what's evidence of um, learning? And um, I'm really very interested in the student learning process. So um, I don't know how many of you are TikTokers. What I love about this piece is how this little girl has really made some self-determinations about 
you know, what she owns, what she knows, and who gave her permission. So let me share this with you. Did you do anything in the bathroom? Mm -mm. Nothing? Mm -mm. I was putting some lipstick on, and then I was giving my phone. So you put, what'd you put on? Lipstick on. Oh, whose was that? It was, it was my lipstick. Oh, it was? Yeah. Did you ask anybody if you could put it on? I asked myself. <laughs> Did you see how it looked? Yeah. Well, how do you, if you could describe it, how would you describe it? No, like. What? Like a noonie was. Like a noonie has big lips, big and eyes. Her mom's, and, and he, he, he pretended it hurts. So whose lipstick is that? A mine. You bought it? Yeah. Where'd you buy that? My lipstick? Yeah. I buy it from Home Depot. <laughs> so I love this on so many levels is that, you know, she's made the determination about, you know, some ownership, right? That she's determined that she gave herself permission for how she looked, how she was going to apply it. Um, she determined where she's going to get it. Of course, Home Depot, we all know that Home Depot isn't you know, the place you get lipstick. Uh, and that's hopefully where we as instructors would come in and say, um, is that the best place to, to look for that resource? But uh, I just love that self-determination that this little girl is displaying. And and she told herself she could, she could do these things. I want to share some things about um, the approaches to teaching and learning. And many of us might have heard that word pedagogy uh, thrown about. But if you've heard pedagogy before, Give me a thumbs up tool there, or you can give me a visual one. Uh, lesser known is andragogy. So let's see it again. If you've heard of andragogy, the ideas of um, teaching adults and teaching adults, as we know, um, is very different than teaching um, children. And then there is pedagogy. How many people have become familiar or heard of pedagogy? Okay even fewer of us. So we think about uh, pedagogy as 1.0 uh, teaching and learning, andragogy in terms of higher education, uh, 2.0, and pedagogy is 3.0. And we're really seeing pedagogy emerging not only in higher education, but we're seeing it emerge in uh, K-12 education, that we're seeing it uh, where we're giving students the opportunity to make decisions about what's important, what's valuable. And in 21st century, we have too much to really unpack in terms of talking about why this is important, the knowledge that is out there is much less finite than the knowledge that was um, to be learned when we first started this whole venture of formal education. So some really interesting things here. So when we take a look at who's leading the learning, and this is really, really scary for some of us because by golly, we have degrees, okay? I have a doctorate right, in instruction and in teaching and learning. So I, I'm an expert. The idea of giving up some control can be really, really scary. And in some ways, you know, I really don't want people to give up control. Like I, I want my doctors to know what the real answer is. I don't want them to figure out what they think the answer is. I want them to be clear about what best practice. But there's other places and spaces where we can look at the difference. So independence, uh, you know, pedagogy will stay in that category. Uh, the learners are problem finders. Their reasons for learning, it, it's not necessarily sequential. It, it may be we start in a particular direction and that direction either doesn't have the answers that we need or we find that we're not as interested in that. We, we go somewhere else. Um, ultimately, we have a destination, but the way that we get to that destination is different and maybe, you know, the final destination shifts. It's inquiry driven. They take a, um, a long-term view, not just what's in the immediate. It's about uh, flow and knowing how to learn. And that's something that some of our students, I think, have lost the ability to do. And I, I really blame um, No Child Left Behind. I, I blame uh, standardized assessments. I blame high stakes assessments and lots of pressure on us in education for students losing 
the ability to know how to learn. If, if you think about, you know, children, they, they know how to go about getting the information they want and somehow they lose, you know, that, um, that, that self confidence. And then what do we do? We, we coach them. We, we problem solve with them. We're sounding words for them. We, we help them to think about their whys and then help them get there. And then we help them to think that they're not alone in the process. So when we look at that, and I think about those ideas and my own philosophy statement, one thing I've really, really loved that the um, syllabus generator has done is it's given us that space for a teaching statement. It's getting us to think about it. So I share this teaching statement with my students and um, I'm very much on the student-centered humanism. I believe in the innate worth of students. I think they need to get their hands around things, either physically or intellectually. My job is to help them feel well prepared and to determine what is evidence of feeling that they're well prepared. And in my particular um, industry, we're looking at future educators. And what you're going to need as a kindergarten teacher is going to be very different than what you need as a middle school math teacher what you need as a high school um, government teacher. There's going to be different needs that you have. And my job is to help them find those, identify those needs and find the resources for it. So when we think about the ideas of assessment, this is where I'm gonna transition into thinking about not only my instructional approach, but what do we think about assessment? What do you want your students to know or be able to do? What's the best assessment method? And I think assessment, can be inclusive of exams, uh, multiple choice or quizzes. It could be an inclusive of formative, a summative. It's inclusive of project-based learning. It's inclusive of writing exams. It's inclusive of uh, collaborative projects. It's inclusive of a lot of things when we think about assessment. And sometimes it's really intense summative and sometimes it could be as easy as a checklist. Either you did it or you didn't. Can you follow instructions? There's a variety of different reasons. And then that bleeds into how are you going to evaluate the students' responses? And then what are you going to do with the information? And sometimes it's determining their ability and their uh, mastery, or sometimes it's the opportunity to go, ooh, I didn't do a very good job with that. I need to go back and, and think differently. When it comes to the four C's, I've really enjoyed the four C's. I've struggled with the four C's. I've done a lot of work with the four C's. And I continue to see it as an opportunity for collaboration and work. So there's two that I'm really feeling like I've got a good path in terms of that. And that's around civic engagement and teaching about controversial issues. Here, my first one is this inquiry project. And I want to share that this is coming with some of the work I've been doing with Mason Public Schools, getting out to my partners, right? and looking at the work that they're doing so that I'm not operating in a vacuum. What do my, uh, my community partner want in teachers? Looking at this work inquiry, this is work that they're doing, looking at what we need in our community and also looking at what our role is as citizens. And so this work with this, uh, the four C's, my work with my partners, my work with my students has really helped me to think about ways to help my students think about their industry and to think about finding the resources out there and then what does that mean to them? Pretty convoluted assignment. And with that, here's some fun stuff. A student who responded to this, she did her analysis and she talked about early childhood and looked in her immediate area and was drawing some conclusions about what was going on in her immediate area. And uh, then thinking about what the quality is using the resources out there. And then what are the conclusions? Why did she choose that information? And what conclusions can she draw? And then also thinking about our civic engagement. So again, we're in her industry. Uh, we're in the uh, four C's, and then we're also taking a look at our role as um, um, members of a um, society, members of a community. So, you know, that was some fun stuff here. So I go back and I take a look here at the uh, four C's, and I look at the assignment that I created, I look at my students' response, 
and then I get the opportunity to determine if I need to improve or not. And I'll be honest, this iteration that I have for civic engagement is way better than what I was doing before. Oh my gosh, I looked at uh, what I tried to pass off as civic engagement, and this is a much better effort here. Uh, the other one I wanted to share with you um, comes from, you know, controversial issues. And boy, talk about hot topics and talk about us being under the fire, right? As educators, not only in K-12, but in higher ed, and then finding ways to bring in contemporary things. And um, when we talk about the use of Canvas, Megan uh, has shown me neat ways of embedding things. Like, look at this, I can put this great video, you know, right here to help guide my students' work. And then now as we take a look at this really controversial issue, we used to have a, we get to have a conversation, then we, we take a look at resources again. They're nervous, right? My, my students are like, how do I go out there? And they're talking about critical race theory and they're talking about, you know, teachers being change agents. And they're talking about things where some parents are coming in and you have to talk about this thing and other parents are going, no, and they're shutting down school boards. How do they handle all of this? And so giving them the opportunity and, and giving them resources and then having them create their own. And then the ways that they choose to create it, giving them a lot of choice there, right? How do I allow them to write or present or create or film or video in, in ways that make sense for them? And so that's another fun thing that I like about the four C's is it not only gives me a really good guideline, but it also gives me lots of freedom and flexibility, which is something that I need as an educator and as a, an individual. And then again, we have the um, C's, what are we demonstrating? Are they analyzing systems? Are they looking at the impact of contemporary and past events? Uh, as I look at this particular assignment, and I wanted to be really honest, I'm thinking I can tweak this to better meet the four C's. And I'm hoping that using the four C's that relate to my course competencies, that it always gives me the opportunity to refine and stay uh, current. My question for you is what are some of the ways that you assess the four C's and how have your assessment efforts driven your instruction as well as the scope and sequence of your course and or program? Uh, what I've done is I use uh, communication with student speeches, and I realized probably after the second semester of using the 4C, um, evaluating the or assessing the student speeches, that a lot of them did not have a clear purpose. And I think I think that's the second uh, rubric item in the on the guidelines, and that they didn't articulate a clear purpose in their speeches. And so what I did was I looked at my content and realized that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about constructing a thesis statement and uh, just, you know, kind of, this is what you need to do and breeze past it. And so I took that feedback, that information and started spending a good portion of time really working through how you determine your general purpose, your specific purpose, and then take those and turn it into a strong declarative thesis statement and uh, noticed after a semester or two that their they are their thesis statements are stellar. If anything that as students have coming out of my class, they can construct and say a very strong central idea thesis statement in their speeches. So it's really helped me uh, figure out that I needed to spend more time working with them on that. Uh, career and technical education program. So we fall more in the critical thinking and communication seat uh, of the four C's than we do for civic engagement, although we have our internships um, that we use with that. And probably the, the place we're probably the lightest on is our cultural engagement. They have their humanities courses and stuff like that. For us, we started having our third year almost ready to graduate. Um, the students start helping us design our animal care policies for taking care of our resident teaching animals. You, guys, you may not be aware, um, but the vet tech program, we have uh, resident teaching uh, dogs and cats, uh, rats and rabbits, and on some occasions goats, the students have to be able to care for them and do all their husbandry. And so we found that we had put together what we thought was a very complete animal care policies and protocol book. 
but we were still having a lot of trouble with students being able to accomplish what we needed them to do to meet our USDA guidelines. And so we had the students make the protocols. Since they're the ones doing all the work and they're the ones that are getting graded and assessed on that, we had them make the protocols and then we went through that. And wow, did they come up with some great, very detailed, orientated bullet point ways of how to clean kennels properly and how to mop properly and how to feed properly and all of that. So the, the four C's really helped us actually be able to make a much more cohesive policy and program for our animal care that we can then also be able to assess everybody equally across the board from our first year to our third year students. And, you know, in some ways it's a bit uncomfortable to think, oh, we're, we're higher ed, right? It, it should be us influencing what, what happens with uh, K-12. But at the same time, I'm, I'm finding that the work that they're doing is, is so phenomenal and the thought leaders that they're following and um, are being influenced by have really a lot of value for who we are. And uh, I remember speaking to a principal last semester who made the comment that this is kind of some of the work that students really are seeking. And if, you know, the students get to vote with their feet, right? That um, if we're, we're not there in terms of understanding how to teach learners in the way that is meaningful to them, that they just won't come. So, you know, I am in no way, please don't say that to me or interpret that to me that I think I have the answers, but boy, I'm like, I better start paying attention, right? And, and what are they saying to me? What, what is it that they're bringing to the table? What do they expect from me? So it's fun, um, really fun. Oh, and I wanna jump in on uh, something, you know, you started your presentation talking about philosophies of teaching and different styles of teaching, right? There's these different theories and styles of teaching. And I think that we may be able to see ourselves in different aspects of all of those, right? There are different seasons mm -hmm. in my career when I was situated within a particular theoretical framework, right, for my teaching practice. And that's changed, that's shifted for me also over time. It also shifts based on who I'm working with, right? Who my students are at this time. But what we talk about in SOC is that there's a need to be aware of your preferences, your, your instructional style, your, your theories about learning, and not to be like all in the clouds about this, but it's good to be aware of what you believe in about teaching and learning because, and then to notice how is that evident in my practice? How is it evident in the materials I choose? How is it evident in which 4C I connect with it? How is it evident in the way that I set up my class or the way that I build assignments and then ultimately how I assess learning? And a topic that came up recently is the idea of attendance as grades. So in a response to COVID, we have been encouraged by administrators to utilize the attendance tool in Canvas. It's an awesome feature. It helps with COVID tracking, but it also by default creates a column in your grade book where attendance attributes them to 100 points in the, in the grade. So I could maybe activate that as an instructor that's trying to contribute to a need that the college has and not think about the impact of that column being in my grade book and does that resonate or not with my instructional practice? And so there's a way then that I can utilize that feature and support the college. But if I don't think that attendance really is direct evidence of demonstrating a course competency, then I'm not going to make that for points. Or I think in mm -hmm. any of our conversations, there's no right or wrong answer for what you choose to do, but it's that you know why you're doing it. It's very clear in Tan's practice, how she's positioned on how she feels about teaching and learning and student self-navigation of learning. And so I think that it's just an interesting thing to reflect on. I encourage more instructors to do that. I actually teach educational philosophy in my foundations of education. And I have a concept map and I actually have the students assess me. So, so now you've been with me for about eight weeks, where do you put me? And, and they, they are very accurate, but they also know that I might live on one side 
So I live on the um, student centered side, but for show, I visit on the you know teacher centered side. There's times that I have to go visit, you know. So it's never a situation where you're all in to one side or the other. And then there's times where I might want to stay over on the um, student centered side, but I, based on how my students are reacting then I have to maybe spend a considerable amount of time on the teacher-centered side. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's, it's just exciting for, for us at SOC definitely to have these discussions with you and be on the lookout for more invitations to these sort of events because we want to engage you all in the discussion. We want to hear what you're doing. We want to share our ideas with you. And we feel that this is so valuable for us all to keep engaging in the continuous improvement and for our student learning. So thank you all and don't hesitate to reach out if you all have questions.